pleasure to welcome Lars Lehrer back in the building uh, for a lecture this evening titled, as you can see, How Blue the Sky Was. And Lars, in uh, typical good form, is already working the weather into part of the story in tonight's discussion about um, not exactly the city, not exactly the non-city, but that kind of in-between uh, idea between those two geographies, which he's an absolute expert of and has been for many, many years. Uh, a lecture that tonight will look at the boom and bust conditions of a city like Houston, but of a condition that I think is increasingly one that we can associate with many places other than Houston, which maybe has experienced it in um, dramatic form. He wrote uh, a few years ago, about five years ago, in a debate that was held between Lars and uh, Peter Calthorpe, he wrote, American speed, uh, American distance. Um, we as architects do not understand this new motorized city. And I think more than anything, Lars's belief is that, in fact, we can come to understand this strange condition, not just go into different forms of self-denial that many architects are equally expert as, um, uh, or just try and mimic past forms of the city that now are increasingly kind of out of date or misaligned to the realities of how all cities uh, operate. His interest in suburban life is one that he approaches with a certain distance as an expat or an exile, perhaps, who came to America uh, many years ago after his graduate studies on the East Coast, but settled into first the West Coast at Berkeley, uh, and then later found his form in the city of Houston, the city non-city of Houston, which will become uh, in part a topic of tonight's presentation, but has been for many, many years the focus of his writings and teachings. Uh, at Rice University, located in Houston, where Lars is the Smith Professor of Architecture at Rice University, and from the early 1990s uh, has been the dean, um, and in the last year stepped down from that role in a school that he's very much shaped over 15 years as an incredible contribution um, to architectural culture, especially in the States. Um, but also for triangulating a country that quite famously tries to understand itself only through the life forms that exist on its coasts, in either East Coast form or West Coast. And Lars rather brilliantly um, um, established a base somewhere in the middle part of the country that really does have an incredibly unique kind of experience about not just what the city is, but also architecture as we know it. Um, Lars, this year, and I think there's a bit of irony to this, finds himself in Rome, which is probably the most peculiar city to imagine Lars operating out of for a year, but I think one that's some form of retribution for everything he's said about cities over the years, but um, has spent that year, and I hope we get to see some of those examples tonight, um, making some brilliant drawings that carry forward his analysis of cities in sometimes cartoon and graphic form. Um, which has really been an incredibly productive year, I think, for Lars's thinking and development um, on the city and as an architect. He's the author of many books, as you all know, beginning in the 1980s with Villa Prima Fasi. Uh, Building the Unfinished was followed by, planned, um, by a book in 2004 called After the City, which is still an incredibly um, useful summary of his analysis um, uh, of the contemporary condition of urbanism, uh, and one that we're very much welcome to welcome back to the AA. Lars, thanks for coming back. Thanks. Well, it's wonderful to be back. Uh, I was here with uh, the old man uh, and him talked with Peter Wilson and had a specta spectacular time. That's when I met Peter Cook and Mark Cousins and, and all the dynamos of this fantastic city. Um, the title is actually a ready-made. Uh, it, it comes from Roland Barthes' A Lover's Discourse. And it describes the moment when you are, maybe for the first time, really in love with someone. And uh, oh, how blue the sky was that day, that wonderful day. That rapidly fades into darkness, of course. And uh, uh, in some way, the American adventure uh, was a, uh, uh, a love affair that had a long uh, and interesting history that I will touch very briefly on. Uh, but America Vespucci, whose first name uh, was America, uh, became America, wrote two letters around 1500. He came after Co Columbus, 
he sailed the coast up and down, and he discovered Columbus, even into his death, thought he had found Asia. But of course, uh, Americo Vespucci was a very brilliant man in many ways, also an Italian. Uh, he discovered that he had, that, that, that had found America. And he wrote two letters back to Europe that were translated into many, many languages. And it was the uh, impetus for Europeans' view of America that somehow still, although it's fragmented and, 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 and broken in many ways because of America's presence in the world, but America has always been utopia for Europeans. And it, that's why people are so upset when America fails. Of course, the, those who live in America know we're not living in utopia. Uh, although the ambition of the American project, which I will talk about today, which uh, is in some way fundamental to its particular qualities, is still there, although it is stalled in cul-de-sacs in suburbia. And of course, that's a horrible future to think about the American project if part of it was going to the moon and walking on it, et cetera. It is pretty dismal that we would end up in suburbia. My particular interest in the American suburban city has to do with my own reality, which is being an immigrant. Immigrants, uh, they're really t roughly two kinds. Those who were forced uh, through slavery and you can, you can really distinguish four aspects of black movement in America. The first stretch between Africa and, and America. The second one out to the cotton fields. The third one up north to, the, to, to, to Detroit. And today, it's actually the largest immigration of Africans ever in American history. It now comes from all over Africa, Somalia, etc., etc. So it's very peculiar if you look at it historically. So that, that's just obviously one experience. For those people, it was not utopia. It was hell. I think it's very, very hard to understand the hardship of this particular experience and what they had to go through in order to find a place in America. They struggled harder than anyone and ought to have all the respect that one should give to people who have had enormous struggle through generations. The other group were escapees, many of them religious fanatics that were running away from state churches, like the Swedes, for example, where I originally came from. I, however, was the modern one. I came with an airplane. I landed, I went to Florida, I tried to buy a boat to sail people around to the islands, got bored on the docks, and went to Berkeley, and the rest is history. Now, there's always been this drive to drive, to move across the country. Go west, young man, is something. And of course, it included women, too, although they weren't mentioned. And then there is another counter movement, which were the blacks, the Latin Americans, that moved this way. For, for example, the island that I know very well that's not on this map that I sh better draw in before my wife you know, uh, discovers that Puerto Rico is not here. Uh, there are four million Puerto Ricans in this island and four million Puerto Ricans in New, in New York. So there is lots of things that are not described by this simple diagram. The, the immigration is fundamental to America. It is probably still one of the only countries that are truly, in the Deleuze and Guattari sense, deterritorialized. De and I think in some way the interest I have in suburbia is precisely because of that. Everything is somehow tumbleweed. Nothing is screwed to the ground. Everything is potentially moving. And the book that I, we just finished my career as a dean, it's called Everything Has to, uh, Must Move, is very much inspired by uh, sort of Deleuze, Guattari. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm, it's a bit of a confessional. Those, those two guys have had an enormous effect on the way I think about suburbia for better or worse. So one of the things that I discovered looking out the high-rise building that I have still an apartment in was I looked out over suburbia, and we'll see an image of it soon, and I realized I don't understand it. All my 
lectures from Aldo Rossi of understanding the European cities with its boulevard and plazas and so on was completely useless. And I experienced, maybe for the first time, what it felt to be like a nomad. No bearings. Everything was imminence. Everything was out there. I do know that something was cooking out there. I could feel it in my stomach. I had no clue what it was. I had to go look. The enormous growth of uh, the metropolis. At first, I thought Houston was a metropolis, so it's not, it's not true. It is, in fact, a city, maybe not even a city. It's a conurbation of the third kind. And I get away with that in, in the book that my lecture is based upon for a simple reason that I don't think we have really any good labels for what these cities are, if there are cities. So in that sense, even the concept of city is deteriorized. Deter in other words, it doesn't, ex it, it, it doesn't know what it is. It has no transcendent kind of, app there, there are no concepts about it. There are no, there are no overlays that forces to be something. It's only, it's only hope is that it, that it will become something. So in that sense, it's in Deleuze and Guattari's sense, it is a body without organs. The most basic, fundamental, kind of physical thing sitting there, waiting to become something that it is not yet. So this is the kind of premise of, 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 of my talk. So let me just start in a Monday. So I, flying in over New Jersey, began my obsession with the suburban sea. The spectacular graphic quality from the air did not match the barren view from the road, and the search began. It is graphically beautiful, even if this is an extremely molested landscape, barely alive. Glamorous in its fall colors, spectacular in terms of its geometries, in its tra movement of traffic, forever moving. Its polluted rivers, brown, yellow, green, are spectacular. Flying in over Houston, first the enormous Houston field, flat and endless, then the weather, smog, haze, hurricanes, floods. It's an absolutely flat world. It has no boundaries. Therefore, distinctly different from Los Angeles that is contained in a smog pocket by the mountains and has therefore four times the density of Houston and is becoming increasingly like a real quote unquote city. Houston has no boundaries. It grows endlessly. It has no zoning. The government of Texas meets every two years. We have a surplus in Texas. In California, it's going bankrupt. This reveals some of my libertarians, libertarian inclinations towards this city. It's about freedom. Freedom with eventually lots of responsibilities that are not always met, as we will see. Downtown sticks out beautifully. You know, it's, it's a bit like uh, you know, one of those metal sculptures you buy from Eiffel Tower. This is the American downtown. It's what I call a mega shape. A mega shape that is made out of similar pieces, but none of them are the same. These are weathers, haze, that you can smell for miles. Hurricanes coming in over, over Houston. We, we forewarn, we buckle down, we shop, we buy water and so on. We settle on the ground floor when you're in a high-rise building. And then it comes. It hits with a vengeance. Everything is vibrating. The windows are bulging like this. It's spectacular, frightening, and a incredible sound. It's like very different from earthquakes that I've been through in California. Hurricanes are a little more predictable, equally frightening equally large, and you realize then that we are up against something that we can't really lick. Weather is there, and it will be there for a long time. 
and you know, it is a glamorous, it is the most glamorous low pressure in our weather system. It's when it, we're fundamentally, it's a kind of funnel like this that sucks up the hot ocean air, 80, 90 degrees, up to the, to the stratosphere that's ice cold. And you get this swirl. This side of the, of the uh, equator it swirls like this. On the other side, it swirls the other way, just like toilets do. If you flush a toilet in, a, in, in, in Argentina, it goes the other way around because of the rotation of the Earth. Nobody believes me. You think I'm lying. Weather comes in. This is my window in my high-rise building. And the weather comes in, and suddenly downtown disappears. <laughs> Gone. And then you have a sustained rain, you have flooding everywhere. This was the last, and this was just a tropical storm in 2001 uh, that inundated the whole city. You can see the inner loop here, the series of loops, and this is the flooding. Uh, when we had the last earthquake, we had the last hurricane, people tried to escape the city all at the same time. They moved about two miles in three hours, 10 hours. You can't escape nature. So here they are, you know, playing chess. I don't know what they do in their cars, but of course, I stayed. Not that we are superior human beings, Swedes, but sometimes you wonder. Wet cars. Five months later, you can buy them for 5,000 bucks, but they never, you never get rid of the smell. Katrina. Real flooding, real death, real danger. This is not to play with. And then there is ultimately a rainbow with gold at the end of it, which is, of course, Texas, the American dream, that you can find gold at the end. So the first measurable unit, pixelizing of the landscape, divide and conquer, is the subdivision. In a in normal city thinking, uh, we talk about blocks, we talk about individual buildings, but in, sub, in, in, in a subdivision in, or in, in a suburban city, you have to talk about subdivisions. Subdivisions are essentially like this. Cul-de-sacs, this is the beginning, this is the promise. Houses being here, you can, you can go here and visit and buy a house down there, and the furniture is slightly shrunk so that it, the house looks bigger. You know, and it's part of a real estate machine, which is extremely efficient. And let's face it, everybody thinks this is a messy place. It isn't at all. This is highly organized, evolved into a true science. And this, of course, you can see here. Up, I don't know how I have the thing here. These are the favorite objects of hurricanes. This is actually, uh, you know, what are they called? Uh, trailer homes. They're the first ones to blow, and they go. <laughs> so this is the weakest point. These are hanging on a little longer, but the roofs fly off. And these are like, boom, boom, cut out. This, we see here example of what leapfrogging. Well, I'll talk more about that. You can see that this is in the making. It's always in the making, never finished, always on the road. And these are merely objects sitting on the ground. What's interesting about this is not the object itself. And I must say, I'm not particularly interested in objects. You poor children, you have to work with objects all the time. I'm really only interested in relationships. It's the only thing that's interesting for me. And the school that I, quote unquote, created uh, brought this idea in, that you cannot really talk about this without talking about all of this which has always been the problem with architecture. And uh, talking about all of this, you have to talk about the real world, about the interactions that create those objects in order to really understand what architecture is and to understand your role in it. And surprisingly, very few architecture schools teach in business models that are fundamental for our future. So this is the fragmented world. Piece of this, piece of that, piece of this, piece of that. Shopping center, lots of cars, pieces of trees, part of a, of a 
kind of endless savanna of trees that was in Texas. It is not the desert. It's a moist prairie. A moist prairie is very different. has a very hard soil. So when it rains on, on Texas in this part of the world, it has to go laterally across the, in, into what's called the bayous, which are rivers, or runoff rivers, because it doesn't go through, they can't penetrate. So that means that we have flooding even with relatively little rain. And here they are. So you get snippets of open space, which is usually some kind of decrepit bayou that has been destroyed by development. And this is the strands of hell in the summer, I can assure you. Not a damn tree. And shopping centers like this. Three wings, parking everywhere. You drive around to find your anchor store and then you go back home. So, I had to develop a set of forensics in order to understand this city that laid in front of me. And that became a, an enterprise in itself. And I will sketch some of these ideas. So here is Texas. As you can see, Texas is very large. In fact, if you drive across Texas, you have driven one third of the country. And Houston is there, Dallas. San Antonio, there's a triangle here. And here is where the wind tunnel, where you get lots of wind. And here's the oil and gas. We'll see a little more of that later on. Uh, you know, this, this is a city without zoning, but it looks terribly familiar to all of us who have been out in, in those parts of the world. Uh, it is already from the beginning a decentralized city. It was never a centralized city. So many American suburban cities have a proper center that's still more or less intact or abandoned, for that matter, if you're in Detroit. And then the escapees around it. Houston was already from, from the beginning deterritorialized. There were more cars in 1910 in Houston than anywhere else in the country. It was always connected to resources. So when we had the terrible depression in the 30s, Houston was doing reasonably well. We were connected to cotton. That's where the blacks were brought in, to the cotton fields. There's very little cotton left. Wheat, tremendous connection to the sea, great railway connections, a major hub. And of course, now it is still the energy center of the world. God knows what's going to happen. We have no more oil. What would happen to Houston is something we can speculate on. I live right there. One of the biggest medical centers in the world, downtown, largely an office park, now become inhabited more and more. And the Galleria, which is the shot. So the, here comes the, you know, the, the, the Latin Americans flying in, uh, moving into hotels here, getting facelifts and butt tucks, butt tucks, while the rest of the family is shopping in the Galleria, and then they fly out again. So it's a perfect a consumer machine. This diagram, fascinating diagram, done by one of the few planners we ever had named Elifrit, who made this diagram in the 40s. What's very interesting about there's no public space, or virtually very little, you know, a large park. All the spa public space is connected to schools. The rest of it is just territorial privacy. So Houston is a highly private city, very little public. The public life is virtual. So it's lived out really through movement and through living, to, to operating in, in a commercial area. If you look now and overlay this, this is a reality check. It hasn't changed very much. It's grown enormously, but basically it's essentially the same diagram. So this guy was very, very insightful about what Houston was about. This is a simple diagram that actually was developed by Land, uh, uh, the Cambridge operation, uh, Institute for City Form, what was it called? Uh, built Environment, uh, where the argument was made that this was a much more efficient building type. And this is the component that makes cities. 
with that architecture is relevant for, for the city. The pavilion, which is the same but opposite to the building in the middle surrounded by open space, abandoned its role as the maker of cities and became just spread out objects that then is connected with freeways. You can see what a dramatic effect this had on the concept of city. It just disappeared. And it's become now some other conurbation that we might not yet have a name for. We call them suburban, but that doesn't really help. Because in some way, it, it is maybe suburban, but ultimately it's something of itself. It, it really needs its own name because it's profoundly different. To live like this, if you just think of this, here, Sue lives across the street, you walk across the street. There, here, Bob lives over here. John is there. Peggy is there. Here, Bob is there. Peggy is out there. Albert is here. The only way you can get to each other is via cars. It's community without propinquity. I began, it's a lot of work I have to skip here, which is more theoretical. Geographies, geographers talk about lines, oh, lines, points, and uh, then there is architects concerned, space and form. But what's really happening is that the cities are becoming more and more like a metabolism, a difficult one. Anabolism, as you probably know, is a, it's when you produce energy, and people who are obese, of course, produce too much energy, and then the trouble we have in cities is to get rid of this junk. So we take something from nature, we transform it to, into technologies and so on, and then we give it back to nature. So we are obviously intimately connected to nature. This sort of separation of body and, body and mind, all of those things are gone. It's finished. The binary world has disappeared. We are now in a limitless world where we have to take account of so many things that influence us. So this is the future of the, of the city. This is how we have to think about the city. And I'm st I am not enough of a biologist to deal with this. It's too complicated. But there are people who are beginning to think this way. My analysis was simply looking out the window and beginning to talk about what I call mega shapes. So this is a mega shape. The ceramic canopy that stretches all over the city. And of course, if you think about cities where rich people and, and poor people live, the rich people live up the hills. Here, you measure the wealth of the community by the thickness of the ceramic canopy. The poorer you are, the less trees there are. So you can read the city very easily by driving through and saying, well, I can pinpoint the, the income group just by looking at the trees which again shows that by, look, that by looking at, 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 at all these aspects that surrounding the objects that we design, we began to understand the city much better. So I name things like the field room that exists underneath here, which is a, in some sense a, the public space, although it's not public. And to, to plant trees has becomes fundamental because this is a shield from from the, the invasive rays of the sun. The speed zone is a zone not just of the freeway, but all the stuff that surrounds it, as we will see. And then the weather is, a, is its own mega shape. Now we include everything that, uh, and this is just looking at, at, at these pieces. This is the Zoemi canopy. And in this world, that is what I have developed before, is stim and dross. In, in cities like London, although I'm starting to, to see that it isn't so lively at night as it used to be, I guess people go to work here too. Uh, but in suburbia, you have a skateboard meet, you have a card game, Hugo's garage where everybody meets with their cars, the Hispanic parking lot stem where after work they open the lid of, of the back of the car, turn on the cumbia and drink, a, drink some beer before they go home to the family or the cocktails, uh, in, or the pool hall meet. And then when it's gone, it's dross. It's gone back to dormancy. So this is this, a city that has this 
And then you can develop actually an activity surface that oscillates. Uh, at noon, there's plenty of activity in downtown. And then it dips early evening, then the cleaners come in and, and it goes up again. The same can be done for all of these. So this is, an, uh, this is not a physical, this is, this is an undulating surface. And you can begin to think in planning terms of how to animate this surface by placing things. Of course, that's never done. Since the, the mechanism that produces these cities is very different than planning. This is, a, again, a typical example of subdivisions. The morphology, that which architects is, I think, overly concerned with. There's a mathematics of the suburban house. So the most dominating grammatical constraints of the suburban metropolis is what I call the American distance. The contradiction to the contradicting urge to both overcome and create distance. This makes clear that human openness to the world always corresponds to an aversion to it. There's always in America a distance, even in this case, a very small one. And here is a sort of strange equation I've developed that talks about overcoming distance from east to west, at the same time as, as separating yourself from your neighbors, or from Jews, or from blacks, from Anabaptists, or for anything that you don't want to be next to. And that's fundamental to the American experience. Leapfrogging. What happens is that the developer comes in, develops this area, looks just perfect like it always there. The land prices go up around it. The next developer goes further out. So you get these like a, holes in the city, what I call the holy plain. And the holy plain is now the further out you get, the bigger holes there are. But that's a form of land banking. That then can go, that when the land prices go up again, people start moving in here. So it's a clever mechanism, not clever, accidental mechanism that then allows for densification just by accident. So the recognition of the genetic dances helped me to see, see, the the, what I call the alphabetic city and to begin the construction of what I call an abecedarium. In other words, the pieces, although I am predominantly interested in, in, in in relationships, they're, they're, I'm showing objects here mostly. Be, because of the discrete morphology of suburbia in the pavilions, you can literally see a kind of alphabetic city. And I put them in categories, parry, subdivision, speed zones, streamers. Streamers are the ones that are much looser. Speed zones are connected to the freeways. Subdivision is that unit, the parry itself is the wonderful, uh, you know. This is a piece of new park in which the landscape architect, Olin is his name, reinvented the moist Perry. This is what happened. It rains and water is everywhere and it slowly floods and tranquilly it just get, gets off this ground into the bayous. You can see the bayou right here. And the bayous are many all through the city. However, they have been mutilated by the same people that mutilated New Orleans, namely the, the Corps of Engineers. The Corps of Engineers are the real villains of the city in America. And it's one of the most powerful uh, military uh, uh, aspects of American society. This is a real bayou. As you can see, it carves itself deeper and deeper and then creates these sort of bananas <coughs> because it breaks through here. This was part of the swirl before. And these bananas become then sort of strange pools, cesspools maybe. But if they're left alone, a new life form takes place there. And this is what the Corps of Engineers did. A fantastic asset. They just paved it. Shit, we need to get the water down the pike, just like, you know, invading Iraq. Let's go right ahead. Boom. Here we go. So they destroy the bayous completely in order to speed up the, 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 the water. Now you're beginning to, 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 to get some activity along. You could bike paths and so on, but it smells. 
uh, because they spill all kinds of junk in it. This is the medical center behind. It's one of the biggest harbors in the world. Blade, Blade Runner City. This is a, a part of the oil, uh, the, the, the refinement of oil. We get spectacular uh, sunsets because of the pollution. Just marvelous. Machinery that is not dead tech. Without that, you couldn't drive your little car. And these things that pump that juice, the perarpic. This is, you get oil out, sorry, you get oil out and then you build these things. This is how we, uh, we, we, we treat nature in order to build to the sky. Subdivision, you, we have been through this. All is walled. This is the most beautiful part of subdivisions when it's like this. Pure, it could be done by a Swiss architect. And if you look at this, it, this has its own living dining. The developer could save some money, so they cut down this wall. Also, the wall between the kitchen. This is 40s. You know, the biggest bedroom for the family, for the for the for the mother and the father. This is the son that goes to college, and these are the two girls. And the garage is as big as a living room. Hasn't changed very much. Here are the kitchen engineers. This is actually selling equipment. But look what it sells at the same time. This is presumably a free society. This is, it sells lifestyle at the same time, surreptitiously in the background. This is what men do, and this is what women do. But wonders, we wonder about architects. That must be weird. And this, is, this is selling air conditioning. This is what men do, this is what women do. This is about five years ago. Look here at the gaze between mother and daughter that's setting the table. We're selling tiles here. This is the most wonderful machine. This is a really, it's a descriptive tool of what happens in America. Pass the buck. Blow the shit down the road. So here we blow the leaves onto the neighbors. And this is what happens. With all problems of, of a pollutionary kind, it's done this way. So this is the most symbolic machinery. This one is also, you know, this is the size of a, a, a living room. This is an old picture. He's gotten much fatter, this guy. Now that's the latest thing. That cuts, cuts the lawn without having to send your kids out so they can just slump in front of the TV or in, on top, in front of the computer, sorry. This is a row house. You say, oh, that's beautiful. But look, it has a wall in front of it. No stoops here. No, no. You enter from the back with a, one of those things, you know. Zzz, wow, you go in because you could be attacked. It turns out that crime is very slight here. The only crime is in poor neighborhoods where, where people, uh, poor people kill each other. And this is what I call the white collar prison. Uh, it has a very good garage, so when the, air, when, when the hurricane comes in, all this stuff blows away and the garage remains with your car. <laughs> so you, you can escape. A wonderful curation. <coughs> Speed zones. If you look at this, you see this is the subdivisions, all with trees. And, but this is the speed zone. It's like an you know, elastic organ, like an amoeba that sticks to the, to, to the freeway. And if you, if, you, if you look at speed, high speed here, slower speed here, and no speed here. So you cut the section through this, you, you have the speed environment. In, in the suburbs, it's like this. And then the, machine, the guy with a the, with the blower comes in and it starts to come alive. This is the, the last remnants, remnants of, of, of the strip. Strips are almost gone, although you see them occasionally. This was, of course, the beginning. You know, you remember Bob and Denise been going to Vegas. Vegas has changed completely. It's now the most pedestrian city in America. 
all of this belongs in the speed zone. Motels, Scottish, you know, eight bucks a night. 18 wheelers. Most of, of what goes on on uh, moves around in, in America is with 18 wheelers. The most dangerous machinery on the freeway. Talking about dangerous machines. They, they, because the guys drive for 12 hours and they're dead tired and boom, they wreak havoc. There's always some you know, bent 18 wheeler somewhere to stop the traffic. The streamers are these things that you can't really, you don't really know why they end up there, downtown, which has its own incredible anthropology. The first world moves in this direction. They work in, their lawyers, they work up in that office to take the elevator down underground and get the car and drive home. This surface is only occupied by people that clean the buildings. That is changing slowly. So in other words, there's a third world operating, mostly Mexicans, because that happened to be the, the third world that we have attached ourselves to here. And this is the, the lawyer's world. So here is a stratification. Now, this is a perfect place to doing some interesting anthropology of what suburban uh, downtowns are. And this, of course, is, is you, remember, you might remember Philip Johnson. He hasn't been dead long enough to have been forgotten like poor Aldo. Parking, endless parking. And you know, if you think that suburbia is the strands of hell, this is the strands of hell. 90 degrees, 100% humidity, the sun is, and you are navigating with your brush and your bucket because you're gonna walk over here and clean an office over there. It didn't work quite because they do that at night. Anyhow, some of the best buildings in Houston are, are parking structures. And this is downtown Houston. You think it's New York. Looks just like it. Airports, also streamers. Churches, 3,000 churches in, 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 in Houston. This is a Mexican sect called La Luz del Mundo. And they're Protestants. But why does it look like the Vatican? The shrunk version. All of this is about freedom. You do what you want, baby. This is one of the most powerful, successful. He has a million visitors a day on his website. This is Joel Osteen that keeps mesmerizing people. Said, okay, making money is fine. You know, you, you are the best. Think for yourself, blah, blah, blah. You know, the, all of this sort of marvelous uh, stuff that makes everybody happy. And then they're the homeless. It's the smallest form of existence housing. This guy, which I've photographed over the year, I didn't photograph him for obvious reasons. But he's been living here on this bench for 10 years. He has moved lately, so I haven't found him yet. If we now start to look at the met metabolic, you know, or the dynamics of the city, it led me to conclude that the city was very similar to what biologists define as a self-organizing system. I began to interview developers. So here is one very clever developer. He said that these six components is what drives his world. Competition, other, other attractors vying for the same morsels in the real estate market. Financing, your reputation and current economic climate, always conservative. Rules, regulations, codes, and accepted unspoken practices. Politics, how progressively rep have progressively replaced zoning. Public opinion formed in neighborhood organizations by boosters and professionals like the NIMBYs are really the only politics left and the only planning devices left. Because if NIMBYs get pissed off, they won't buy a high-rise building, then they start organizing and the, and the city changes. And the market, of course. And of course, risk. Something that's very hard to measure. And that produces this. We have seen some of these. This is what happens. Uh, developers move into a neighborhood that is uh, weak in the sense of the prices are low. Um, they move in and start shopping, buying clandestinely, one after another. And then overnight, create what, what I call turbulence and builds an attractor that then brings in smaller developers like pilot fish that starts building around it. And this is how neighborhoods change. 
This is a, one of the major big attractors. This is the medical center in Houston that started in 1922 to 45, very little happened. And over the years, all now to two, 2007, you can see the enormous growth. It's one of the biggest medical centers in the world. And this turbulence that it produced is astonishing because the land prices are affected in all of these areas. Here it's maybe indirectly affected, but not so much. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me, I'm about to die. Uh, so all of these, you can, you can un you understand how complicated this city becomes. It looks so simple, but all these forces that are really virtual forces are pushing and shoving around. So if you are a developer, you have to have, and nobody has perfect information. This is the only way of doing this is to, you know, listening to the ground. And it, it cre creates, uh, so I'm coming to the, to the end. Since anything whatsoever can happen at any time, how do we approach the future? The new objectification of air and landscape poses immediate challenges. The bio is no longer a mere runoff system in the hands of the Army Corps, but our guilty conscience. It lays itself. The ecologist shadow is laying itself over this essentially diagram of the city and knocks on everybody's door. What are we going to do about the landscape we have destroyed? What happens when, it, when, when we have an ozone alert? The hospitals are filled with children and elderly with asthma conditions. The only way that we can gain as architects some importance in the subdivisions in the areas of the city. Since we gave up on it for a long time ago, architects became, they became only in, uh, involved in, cust in customs housing instead of mass housing, not realizing that you can make a buck on every house you built, and if you build the same house, you can make a lot of money. Now, the only way to return to the city, to have some importance, is through ecology which is going to be the great challenge for these cities. It has to do with transportation, obviously, but the cars are going to be licked. We're going to have, we, ha we will have vehicles that will do reasonably well. The real problem is the polluted ground, the polluted air, the water, where the aquifer, where you drink, getting drinking water is being polluted. All of those things are really large issues that cannot be done by single individuals but has to be done by communities. And here's where the challenge lies for us. So yet those newly discovered objects will soon become the demons. I'm talking about the air, for example. How do we keep them fluid, alive, and prosperous? Oh, it's, oh it's, you know, we, uh, architects are, oh, yeah, it's, you know, who gives a shit about the green movement? It's, you know, let the guys in private suit take care of that, you know, green hats and all that. Uh, so we do, we, we create monsters that we don't want to touch. But in this case, it's not efficient. We need to really pay it more broadly. How do we reinvent the American project? After all, our destiny cannot be the future proliferation of cul-de-sacs. Okay. I'd be glad to answer questions, yeah. that there is a poverty there is a poverty in form in the architect's vocabulary because form comes from form architecture comes from architecture I think that by understanding in the Deleuzean sense that everything is a machine potentially viable for architectural form yes it's very complicated to take the weather and turn that into architectural form 
But I think that we have foreclosed on an opportunity to make more interesting form by not looking at the physical environment as a metab metabolic system. Isn't it surprising that, maybe not so much in England, but in America, still we bake in the electrical system and the sewage system in the walls, and they're the ones that are going to break first. The walls are going to last the longest. It's a completely idiotic proposition. And that, to me, is not understanding that those systems are part of architecture. We hide them. But one, for example, if you make a, 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 a laboratory today, the mechanical system is going to be three times as expensive as the structural system. So unless you know as an architect about mechanical systems, but you left that to some technologists, you've lost already. In other words, we need to expand our vocabulary to become more efficient in claiming the ground we have lost. Now, architects might not be up to this task. Entirely possible, well, you will then be the handmaidens of capitalism, like always, and that's <laughs> fine, I guess, as long as you can get a BMW. But it's relatively uninteresting if you have ambitions to create liberty for you and your children freedom, interest, challenges, to get a line of flight, as Deleuze and Guattari says, where you lose everything and it's just delirious because you're flying. And that is your profession, to find that line of flight that makes you come alive in a new way. That is the task we have, is to be happy and free. Democracy is very important. We have to fight for it every day. And all of those things, to me, are the fundamental reason to be an architect. Yes, it's fun to make all these weird forms. Yes, you see them, but that's going to be gone soon. Look, postmodernism didn't last very long. Modernism, presumably, is still with us, you know. Uh, but come on, that's not where it's at. Find your machinery, you know. Make flying things. Things that move. Questions? Territorialized machinery. That's what we need to make. Uh, I have a, a bit of a methodological question. So, when we, as teachers and students of architecture and urbanism, um, approach this condition, I think what's interesting is in your work that comes from after the city. Um, there is an interesting convergence of both thinking abstractly about the city, which is that what you're asking us to kind of break out of a formal mold. But at the same time, what I found in my experience in teaching architecture is the student found your method of visualizing those new elements, those new conglomerations that you give in these very characteristic names, incredibly helpful in, in jumping from very abstract information and things you're referencing, yeah. ecology, real estate pressure points, statistics into something that we can work with and understand and then manipulate on our architectural level. Would you say this is a similar in a way that we do need to approach environments and um, find those new taxonomies and find architectural way perhaps of dealing with them and, and defining those elements architecturally? Would you, uh, uh, would you say that we, we're in a way then to close into our own world again? No. I, you know, I basically agree with you. I think that what I try to do in my drawings, and the diagram is, seems to be almost dead because everybody can now draw buildings from that look like buildings right away. The diagram is fundamental because it describes both virtual and uh, what's the what's the opposite of virtual? I have forgotten. Actual. Uh, it's things. You can, and you can confuse them. You know, when I, when I show the diagram of the activity surface, well, that's probably static there. But once you realize that these things vibrate and it's alive, it's a completely different idea than a physical thing. You have to, you have to understand that some things don't ha cannot be objectified. They are streams. They are, so if you can describe the world in those terms, you have any broken ground. You have er er erased the limit between yourself and the world. To, so in other words, to reinvent hand drawing, unless we can find computers that can do this, but I don't think so, but computers think binary. 
we don't. So, you know, looking at, you know, having P Peter Cook right in front of me, who has drawn all his life, you look at those drawings, enormous richness, of, that have always skipped over a very large landscape. It's not just the technology, the other things there. Look at, look at the landforms he draws. I mean, in other words, there is a tradition of drawing that, in a sense, ought to come back. Together with computers, the more, the more the merrier, as far as I'm concerned. But just to, you know, so I didn't say this very clearly, but suburbia would have died without the virtual world. It has been reinvented. You are as connected today in a suburb in Houston as you are in New York. The only problem is that in, in New York you have all the noise and the smell, and there you can sit right in front of your living room and do your thing. So in some way, all these things that happen in, in Silicon Valley happen in garages in suburbia, you know, the, the Apple people. So to me, we have a much more equal world now. We can no longer play this game that cities are good and suburbs uh, suck. No, we have to be more careful. With, with that goes, an old, a, 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 the whole, our whole world has been de Ter 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 I can't say the word territorialized. And that is, um, in my book, marvelous because it allows us to be everywhere. So my drawings attempt to kind of push the envelope by confusing the virtual and the actual. Questions? You know, I. In terms of my drawings, I, I have always drawn. But art has been very important to me. There's a big exhibit in, of De Chirico, and I, I drew like De Chirico when I was uh, hanging out with Aldo Rossi. Those, those I, I can still draw like that if you force me to it. But it's no longer interesting to me because it always depicted the physical. But what De Chirico did, he described the, what he called the metaphysical. And in some way, this is a reinvention of the metaphysical. That there is stuff that we can't see, but we can smell and hear and touch, maybe, even if it's darkness, that needs to enter into our vocabulary as architects. You know, Frampton well, yeah, is one of the first people that, that started to talk about the, 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 the tactile. I'm not that good in literature, so maybe there are several people before him. But anyhow, to bring in to this hegemony of the, of, 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 of the visual is very powerful. But at the same time, you have to be skeptical about it. This skepticism about what we see, Freud taught us that. You can't look at somebody and find out what goes on inside. You have to do a little more penetration. So uh, it is, in a sense, to do a kind of psychoanalysis of the city. That ought to be a very exciting project. And when you look at metabolic, you know, you realize that when 80% when of, of the population is, is, is overweight, what kind of effect does that have on the city? How we think, how we move, you know? All of those things are a fascinating subject to me and hopefully to you too. So in other words, go out and dig. I learned from the situation, or from not from the, but from the, from uh, some sociological thing. If you're in doubt, go out and look. It's the best way of doing it. Go out and look. The world out there. Lars, thank you. Thanks very much for coming back. Thank you.